me back up. So, um, what happened in England after some of these books were written was there were, first of all, there were what they called SAB groups, sabotage groups that would go out and sabotage hunting. They were against hunting, and they were against, you know, growing animals for food and all of that. And, but they were basically anarchists because they would go out and they would um, ring bells, cut fences, do whatever they needed to do in order to disrupt a hunt. And then that grew into following the Vietnam War, activists, a lot of activists were looking for causes in Europe. And you had the Greens, you had neo-Nazis, you had skinheads, you had every kind of, every kind of sort of uh, des disparate group that was looking for a home. And they came together and they formed this big anarchist movement to help animals. But anarchists can't raise money because they're operating in violation of the law. So it isn't like they can go and create a post office box and say, send your money if you agree with us to this particular location. They would be caught and go to jail. So instead, they began, they got organized, they got a couple of pretty savvy leaders working with them. And they began to take over mainstream traditional animal welfare groups, some of them that in England that had existed for more than 100 years. And little by little, they infiltrated, and then they used all of the typical uh, takeover tactics that happen in business. They packed the boards and, and you know, got the election set, and then they owned it, and they owned the treasury. And then they used those organizations to become media uh, conduits. And so a laboratory would be broken into, people would go, oh, that's terrible, we burnt the laboratory down. They don't have a lot of facts, but most people can recognize fire isn't good, right? Um, but then they would have somebody inside this new, this organization, they took over saying, well, we're, we're against fire, but we think that what's happening to those animals is just as, anyway, so they would provide a voice and a conduit for money. And what's kind of interesting, and, and to Rod's point, is that the first executive director for PETA in the United States, remember PETA, they all have English accents, right? Or at least Ingrid Newkirk, the main founder, does. Um, their first executive director was one of the takeover people for the British Union for the abolition of vivisection, which was the first traditional mainstream group they took over in England. So there is a very specific MO for fundraising and how you, how you do this.